The friends you talk to, the pets you play with, the flowers you see, the bees by a fountain, the trees that give you shade. All living things are made of cells. When we look inside this microscopic world, all we see is simply cells. Hello, I'm Kimberly Morgan, and today we're going to take an in-depth look at the building blocks of life, cells. And at the end of this program, you'll be able to identify the basic parts of an animal cell and a plant cell. You'll also be able to list the functions of those structures in the cell. We're also going to show you how to build a cell model. It's a great way to see that cells are three-dimensional structures. They certainly don't look that way through a microscope. And they didn't look three-dimensional when Robert Hooke, an English physicist in the 1600s, saw them. He coined the term cells after observing cork through a compound microscope. He thought the small boxes looked like rooms or cells in a monastery. And ever since then, we've been using the term to describe the smallest unit of life. After nearly two centuries of research on cells, scientists had gathered enough information to form a cell theory. It states that all living things are made up of one or more cells. Cells are the basic units of living organisms and carry on all life processes. And cells only develop from other living cells. Now that we know a little history about cells, let's take a closer look at what they actually do. A cell spends its day working, moving, processing, growing. It's like a non-stop factory. Every moment of its life, this cell factory processes water, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and chemicals. In order to maintain productivity, a cell needs the help of its organelles, or small organs. Now these organelles don't look like the organs in our bodies, but these tiny structures do have a job which help the cells grow, move and live. You can think of them as an uh, assembly line. Each part has a role to play to make the final product. Cells have many organelles in common. The cell membrane, nucleus, nucleolus, centrioles, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, mitochondrion, Golgi apparatus, vesicles, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and vacuoles. Keep in mind that some cells have all of these parts while other cells may only have a few, but it's still important to know each one. Let's begin with the cell membrane. The cell membrane, or plasma membrane, regulates what comes in and what goes out of the cell. It plays an active role in what the cell takes in, like nutrients, or removes, like waste. It's a semi-permeable membrane, which means it can control the rate at which substances enter or leave, depending on the needs of the cell. The cell membrane is made of a double layer of phospholipids, a fatty substance, and proteins. Proteins are located throughout the membrane and help move molecules, chemicals, and nutrients in and out of the cell. The cell membrane also holds in the cytoplasm and protects the organelles. Keep in mind as we talk about the other organelles that their membranes are also composed of two layers of phospholipids and proteins. It's time to begin our cell model. Juwan is going to help me out by building it. Let's head over to the lab and see what he's picked to represent the cell membrane. Hi everybody, I'm going to make a 3D cell model using different things to represent the organelles. I'm going to start with this plastic bag, which will be the cell membrane. If you're going to make your own cell model, remember that the membrane needs to be flexible enough to allow the cell to move and thin enough to show that it's semi-permeable. You know, it controls what goes in and out of the cell. I'll be back in a little while to show you the other organelles after Mrs. Morgan introduces them. Thanks, Shuan. We'll check back with you in a few minutes. Now, let's look at the organelles inside the cell membrane. The cytoplasm includes everything inside the cell membrane, except the nucleus. Also part of the cytoplasm is the cytosol, a gel-like fluid made up of mostly water, proteins, and some chemicals. Take a look at the inside of this egg. 
This liquid is like cytosol. But the jelly-like area in this cell just doesn't sit there. There's a lot going on in this gooey space outside the nucleus. Many of the cell's life processes, such as making proteins and dissolving waste, take place in the cytoplasm. It also keeps the organelles moving in a process called cytoplasmic streaming. Within the cytoplasm is a scaffold or skeleton called the cytoskeleton. It's made of long, thin protein fibers and microtubules. It provides strength, support, and shape for the cell. It also anchors the organelles and helps the cell move. When you look at a cell through a microscope, the first part you may see, mainly because it's the largest part, is the nucleus. A cell that has a nucleus is a eukaryote. Most multicellular organisms, like humans, are eukaryotic. Cells that don't have a nucleus are called prokaryotes. Bacteria fall into this category. The nucleus is the control center for everything that happens inside a cell. The nucleus directs the organelles to make sure everything functions properly. Just like you use instructions to build something, the nucleus contains all the instructions to tell the cell what to do. Those instructions are in the form of dioxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. DNA is the hereditary information that cells need to function. The nucleus sends those instructions to each organelle, builds proteins, and keeps track of the DNA. The nucleus has its own membrane called the nuclear envelope. It's also semi-permeable, allowing proteins and ribonucleic acid, or RNA, to enter or leave the nucleus. RNA is chemically similar to DNA and provides a copy of the instructions for building proteins needed by the cell. Inside the nucleus is the nucleolus, shown here as a small, round, dark area. Cells may have one or more nucleoli, or none at all. The nucleolus helps build ribosomes, the cell's protein producers. An organelle located just outside the nucleus is the centrosome. Inside the centrosome are a pair of smaller organelles called centrioles. They lie perpendicular to each other near the nucleus and are composed of microtubules. The centrioles play a role in cell division. When a cell divides using mitosis or meiosis, the centrioles migrate to the poles of the cell and create the spindles. The spindles act like cables that pull the cell apart. Now that I've reviewed the cytoplasm, the cytoskeleton, the nucleus, the nucleolus, and centrioles, it's time to head back to Juan's lab to see these organelles in his 3D cell. Take it away, Juan. Thanks, Mrs. Morgan. I'm going to use this gel to represent the cytoplasm. We can imagine that it's full of chemicals, water, and proteins. I'm going to use this bowl for support. The cytoskeleton will be these thin straws used to represent the microtubules, and this thin spaghetti will be the filaments. The nucleus will be the largest organelle. I'm going to use this plastic sphere as the nucleus. Inside, I'm going to put the DNA which are pipe cleaners twisted into a double helix, and the nucleolus, this dark marble. The DNA contains all the instructions for the cell, and the nucleolus helps make ribosomes. The nuclear envelope will be the plastic shell.
For the centrioles, I'm going to use these noodles. They work during cell division. What happens is the centrioles replicate or copy themselves and create spindles that pull the cell apart. Like that. I'm going to place the centrioles perpendicular to each other near the nucleus. It's looking pretty good so far. Let's head back to Mrs. Morgan's lab to find out about the other organelles. Great job, Juan. In order for an animal cell to handle moving, growing, and reproducing, it needs energy. It gets its energy from food, mainly from carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, which are fats. These large molecules, or macromolecules, are very important to a cell. Many of the organelles spend their time making or processing them. The endoplasmic reticulum processes many of the proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates made by the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum is attached to the nucleus and loops back and forth to provide a larger surface area for processing those nutrients. It also separates molecules that belong in the cytoplasm from those being transported to the other areas of the cell. If we were able to get close enough to the endoplasmic reticulum, we would notice some parts that look bumpy while others look smooth. There are actually two types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum synthesizes lipids or fats and carbohydrates. Lipids are required for growing the cell membrane and membranes of the organelles. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum also works to detoxify the cell of poisonous substances. The rough endoplasmic reticulum builds proteins with the help of ribosomes. Ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, giving it that bumpy or rough look. Ribosomes are the protein builders of the cell. They can be found floating in the cytoplasm or attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes may look round, but if you look closely, they're actually made of two subunits, a larger one and a smaller one. After the ribosomes build proteins, the proteins move to the Golgi apparatus. As the cell's distribution center, this organelle is in charge of packing, modifying, and moving proteins and other recently made substances from the cell. It basically takes simple molecules, combines them into more complex molecules, then distributes them. These complex molecules are placed into vesicles, which transport their cargo from the Golgi apparatus to various locations, including the cell membrane, where the nutrients can be released from the cell. Vesicles are also found in the cytoplasm. They transport substances from one place to another. Let's take a minute to see how these organelles would look in our 3D cell. Okay, so now we have to put in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, the Golgi apparatus, and vesicles. I'm going to use these ribbons to represent the endoplasmic reticulum. For the rough endoplasmic reticulum, I've attached these beads to represent the ribosomes. I'm going to start with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I'll fold it up. Now I'll fold the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to put them pretty close to the nucleus since the endoplasmic reticula are a part of the nuclear envelope. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes, but remember there are free-floating ribosomes too. And since they are made of two subunits, one large and the other small, I'll use these beads for the ribosomes. I've made the Golgi apparatus, the cell's distribution center, out of modeling clay. The proteins move through, and once they are made, they get put into vesicles. So if you pinch off a part of the Golgi apparatus, 
we'll get a vesicle. That all goes into the cell. It's getting pretty full, but there's still more organelles I need to add. Back to you, Mrs. Morgan. Thanks, Juwan. Earlier I said that cells need energy to move and grow. They have their own energy generator called a mitochondrion. In fact, mitochondrion is often called the powerhouse of the cell. A mitochondrion breaks down substances like sugars for energy and water for oxygen. This process is called cellular respiration. Inside the mitochondrion are folds called cristae. They increase its surface area and help with the breakdown of molecules. The plural for mitochondrion is mitochondria. You may have heard that term before. It's important to know because these organelles can multiply quickly. Since they have their own DNA, they can self-replicate. That means they can copy themselves over and over depending on how much energy the cell needs. So if the cell needs lots of power, it will have several mitochondria. When a mitochondrion stops functioning, it needs to be removed from the cell. Luckily, the cell has lysosomes to do just that. Lysosomes break down worn out organelles, debris, and large ingested particles. Inside the membrane of the lysosomes are digestive enzymes, which take care of cleaning out all the unwanted, useless, and unnecessary substances. We can compare lysosomes to a trash collector who picks up the garbage. We couldn't function properly with all our trash around us, and neither can our cells. Other organelles that break down substances are peroxisomes. They have enzymes inside, and their job is to rid the body of toxic substances, especially hydrogen peroxide. Peroxisomes are self-replicating, so they can reproduce depending on how many are needed. Sometimes you may see bubbles floating inside a cell. They're called vacuoles. These pockets store different molecules like food or oil, which the cell may need to survive. Some of them even hold waste products to protect the cell from contamination. Okay, Juwan, it's time to head back to you. Do you have all the organelles I mentioned? Mitochondria, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and vacuoles? I've got them all right here. I'm going to use these jelly oranges to represent the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell. We'll put in a couple of them to begin with. But if the cell needs more energy, remember, mitochondria can self-replicate because they have their own DNA. The lysosomes will be these marbles, and the peroxisome will be these darker ones. Each one has different enzymes to break down different substances. And finally, I'll use these for the vacuoles. In an actual cell, the vacuoles will be filled with water, oils, chemicals, or substances that can contaminate the cell. They're pretty handy to have around. Well, I think that just about does it. See, cells are three-dimensional structures. The shape of a cell is different depending on what the cell does in the organism. But cells pretty much have the same basic parts in common. Now that we're done with the animal cell, let's go back to Mrs. Morgan to learn about plant cells. I know they have a couple structures that aren't found in animal cells. That's right, Juwan. In fact, there are two structures found only in plant cells. Plants have a cell wall in addition to a cell membrane. The cell wall helps the plant maintain its shape. Instead of being flexible, the cell wall is rigid. It's made of cellulose, a substance made in the cytoplasm. The chloroplast is the other organelle found only in plant cells. Inside the chloroplast is a substance called chlorophyll, which gives plants their green color. Chloroplasts take the sun's energy and convert it to sugars, creating power for the plant in a process called photosynthesis. Plant cells also have many of the same structures found in animal cells. They also have vacuoles, which are usually larger than the ones found in animal cells. When you water your plants, 
the water is kept in vacuoles. So if you overwater, the vacuoles will sure be full, but they'll never go beyond the cell wall because it's so rigid. Juan, do you have a three-dimensional plant cell that you can show us? Yes, actually I've already made a plant cell with most of the same parts as the animal cell. I used green gelatin for the cytoplasm and put in most of the same basic structures. In my completed plant cell, I have the cell membrane, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticula, rough and smooth, the Golgi apparatus, vesicles, mitochondria, ribosomes, vacuoles, the cytoskeleton, and the centrosome. Oh, you won't see any centrioles in my plant cell model. That's because plants don't have centrioles. Now they do have a centrosome that works during cell division. They just don't have the centrioles inside like an animal cell. Interesting. The cell wall in our plant model is a rectangular glass dish. We can see that the cell wall is sturdy enough to keep plants tall and straight. Looks like this plant just got water because here's the central vacuole with water inside. Remember, it won't ever get past the cell wall. In flowers and more complex plants, the central vacuole takes on the job of the lysosome. You know, the trash collector in an animal cell. It's pretty rare to find lysosomes in plants, except maybe for some algae. I use these for the chloroplasts. Inside is the chlorophyll, which helps in photosynthesis and gives plants their green color. Well, looks like I'm all done here. These models were a great way to show all the cell structures, and they were fun to make. Thanks, Mrs. Morgan, for asking me to help out. You're welcome, Juwan. You did a great job. In their tiny world, all these organelles work together to create life. It's that team effort that keeps all living things moving, growing, and reproducing. Thanks for joining us today. Have fun trying to make your own cell models. And remember, the smallest units that represent life are simply cells.